Welcome back to Myeloma 2018. We've just finished the first day of our meeting, uh, which is always a, a highlight in the myeloma community, looking at the translational science around uh, therapeutics for myeloma. And I'm joined today by my uh, distinguished colleagues, Dr. Sagar Loniel from Emory and uh, Dr. Ken Anderson from Harvard, from Dana Farber Cancer Institute. So let's just get right into it and let's uh, get your first impressions of what you heard today that was uh, of interest to the myeloma community was exciting. Ken, do you want to start us off? Surely. Um, once again this year, um, remarkable progress. It doesn't seem possible that every year it can keep uh, improving and getting better like this. Uh, but we learned an awful lot about, on the one hand, precision medicine in myeloma. So the ability to profile cells genetically and epigenetically um, not only in the bone marrow, but actually at a single cell level, single cell sequencing, even in the peripheral blood. And we also looked at and heard wonderful talks about uh, cell-free DNA. In other words, looking at actual, the genetic material from a myeloma cell circulating in the peripheral blood. Not actually substituting for testing the bone marrow, but clearly reflecting what's going on in the bone marrow and giving us a better picture of really the whole body uh, involvement with myeloma at a given point in time. But I then think having sort of a new uh, window on myeloma, if you will, uh, we also heard, Keith, about wonderful new treatments. Um, the promise of, of precision targeted therapies uh, is actually coming true in myeloma. Uh, it's very complicated because myeloma is complicated to start with and continues to evolve, but nonetheless, there were new classes of agents. You yourself had screened a number of uh, available drugs and found a new target uh, in our disease. Um, and then complementing the progress in precision medicine was exciting data about immune therapies. And uh, honestly, um, that really is, in my view, very exciting. We had a lot of discussions about how we can get in patients an immune response against their own tumor. And I'm of the view, and we had a panel discussion about this, is how can we combine on the one hand the targeted treatments, precision medicine, with the immune therapies, get rid of myeloma, minimal residual disease, potentially with targeted therapies, but restore immune function in the host so that these responses can be long-term. So we really, um, you know, it's a hugely exciting time and all kinds of reason for optimism. That's a great summary of the day. Sagar, what did you, uh, what did you take home? Yeah, you know, I think one of my favorite parts was the precision medicine, has it been a bust or not sort of discussion. And um, I, will, I will take a slightly different view than you did. I think precision medicine in myeloma thus far has not been terribly successful. Uh, but I think the tools that we heard about, like single cell sequencing, really give us the opportunity to hone in on, when you start a diagnosis, you may have 10 or 12 clones but hopefully by the end of induction, by the end of transplant, you're down to one or two clones and single cell sequencing may be able to get us there and that's where precision medicine may be its most effective. So that was a really neat uh, idea, mm -hmm. I think. In, ter in terms of new targets, uh, you know, I'm really excited about MCL1 as a target and seeing the data on potential, um, uh, the use of linkers, whether it's degronomids or VH, uh, VHL as a potential linker, that concept is, is just scientifically such a neat idea. And to be able to see that come to fruition with important targets in myeloma, I think was really, was really interesting. Yes, I, you know, I, I, to me, uh, the, you know, I had set up the question of is precision medicine successful in myeloma or not, and I found that very encouraging conversation because as we talked it through, it became clear that there's been many um, experiences people are beginning to have where applying precision medicine is showing mm -hmm. promise for at least part of the myeloma, and when we combine it with immunotherapies or with existing drugs, uh, or monoclonal antibodies, then, then we're beginning to see these things working in harmony. And the new technologies are allowing us to dissect that at, at very fine specificity. I was also quite taken by uh, some of the diagnostic workup. You mentioned cell-free DNA. I was also uh, quite uh, uh, enjoyed Angelo Dispensieri's mm -hmm. uh, discussion on using mass spectrometry for, for protein electrophoresis replacement, which I think has got huge potential. 
What, um, what else got your attention today? I mean, we heard about a lot about new targets, Ken. You talked about many of them in your presentation. And that was also very encouraging that there's so many new things still bubbling up that we have to address. Well, I think we, one of the, um, I think, great potential uh, new modalities in our disease are called the degronomids or the, yeah. the idea that drugs can be designed now that actually turn on the body's natural degradation system. And we, should, we in myeloma should be proud of this because it derived from the immunomodulatory drugs. Right. But there were several talks here in terms of uh, synthesizing a novel class of drug that is part immunomodulatory drug, so it binds to cerebellum, and it turns on the natural proteasome system for degradation. But these drugs are also linking to the particular substrate on the cell surface or in the cytosol of a myeloma cell that you want to degrade. And BRD4 was one such target. People are talking about how to get rid of MYC, CMYC. And uh, uh, MCL1 was also discussed. But this is a whole new world because even when medicines couldn't be designed, these degraders are really coming to the clinic. I do think there's, um, for the first time, going to be epigenetic therapies in myeloma. And I mentioned a particular one that we're excited about called PRMT5 inhibitors, just because there's a drug and it's coming. And then we have another uh, idea that. You know, proteasome inhibitors in myeloma have arguably be, been among the most successful drugs ever, but that whole pathway can be blocked at different levels. Even upstream where you have the ubiquitinated misfolded protein before it enters the proteasome is introduced to the proteasome by a ubiquitin proteasome receptor. And we have now uh, successfully blocked at that level. And there's a company that's working with us. And I think we'll be able to test the concept. If you block up above the proteasome, can you actually overcome, even when there's resistance to degradation blockade down lower, if you block upstream in the same pathway? Or maybe you can even augment and add and block at two levels. But anyway, there's, there's um, uh, some of these are old news, the proteasome ubiquitin system, but at a new spot. And some of them are entirely new therapies, such as the epigenetic treatments. You know, I, I think some of the drugs you're talking about are probably still a few years away. What did you, you, you're excited about MCL1. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about that, Sagar? What's got you excited about that? Yeah, M MCL1 is sort of a cousin, if you will, of BCL2. And BCL2 is the target for venetoclax, for instance. And so um, while venetoclax, I think, in a certain population of patients with myeloma has been really very exciting, complete remissions in patients that have failed multiple therapies, um, most myelomas are not BCL2 dependent, they are MCL1 dependent. And so um, the challenge with MCL1 has been first identifying a true MCL1 inhibitor. For years I think we had things that didn't quite fit the bill and were billed as MCL1 inhibitors, but we finally have now three that I think are true bona fide MCL1 inhibitors, and those are in early phase clinical trials, and, and certainly the data in vitro uh, looks very exciting. Larry from our group has done a lot of work profiling patient samples and has found what he thinks is a sweet spot, uh, even in patients who may be BCL2 dependent. They may also be MCL1 dependent as well. So I think it really does give us a lot of promise. Well, there, you, sorry, go ahead. I think one other highlight for today I'll just quickly mention is a large discussion about or what are the events, whether they be inside the myeloma cell or immune related that correlate with progression from monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance to smoldering myeloma to myeloma. And there are genetic changes, surely, but many of the genetic changes that are present in myeloma are already there at very early stages. So we heard some nice new data and exciting data how people are right now and will be in the future monitoring for example, the host immune function, yeah. what happens to the host's patient immune system as their disease progresses? And that obviously has very important implications for treatment. And, and I think, you know, the, the interesting thing about that, because the microenvironment monitoring is not something 
we've been able to do effectively until we had single cell sequencing technology. So that again, I think was sort of the technology of the day, if you will. Um, but I, I think when we talk about CAR T cells, and that there was a lot of talk around CAR T cells today. We're gonna get into those and, tomorrow. And I know there's gonna be more tomorrow, but, but this whole idea of is it just the cell or is it the other things in the body that impact outcomes? And we can't really measure that up until recently. Well, there you have it. On our first day, we had more precise and sensitive diagnostics, new technologies for drug discovery, new drugs, new immune therapies, and uh, more progress. So uh, we'll meet again tomorrow, and we'll add immunotherapy to the list. So thank you for joining.